so many of you uh, here tonight. We've got a good crowd. Uh, so I'll ask as folks are, are coming in, um, I welcome you to use the chat function. Um, I'm, I know we're all becoming Zoom experts these days, but in case you don't know, there's a little chat bubble, should be at the bottom of your screen. And I'd encourage you all um, to say hello, um, tell us where you're calling in from. Um, and if you'd like to share what kind of beverage you're enjoying tonight, um, you can add that in there too. Um, you'll notice that uh, the, there's an option to, to talk with the panelists only, and then there's the option to talk to panelists and all attendees. So uh, feel free, we've got a big crowd tonight. Um, we've already got questions coming in for our speakers, which is great. So um, go ahead and, and uh, introduce yourselves as uh, all of us are uh, coming in uh, to our virtual party. And there's Christopher uh, enjoying seltzer. I'm having polar grapefruit seltzer myself. So glad to see so many folks um, coming in. Um, so again, you'll use the, the chat function. Uh, we won't be monitoring, just a little housekeeping as we get the party started. We won't be monitoring the hand raising function on the participants. So your best bet is to, um, to use that chat function and you can talk right to us by using just panelists, or you can choose, I believe it says all panelists and attendees um, to say hello to everyone. So um, we are another housekeeping piece. Uh, we are recording this this evening, uh, just so you know, um, we think that that's gonna work, right? Our intention is to record this this evening, I should say, um, and we'll have that available uh, for folks uh, after the event. Um, so, as you can maybe tell, this is not my living room. I'm broadcasting to you uh, live from the fiction room. Um, and I have to say, this is an evening that I look forward to every year. Um, it's one of the rare occasions for me anyway, where I get to put on my party clothes uh, and come and see the space that I love so much be transformed with beautiful decorations and amazing food. Um, and most importantly, it's a time that I cherish to get to visit with friends and neighbors and so many people who love the library. So I'm sad that you all couldn't be in this room with me tonight, um, but uh, I look forward to future celebrations. And uh, I come to you tonight with my, the party decor of 2020. I brought my fanciest mask out. This is the one from the drawing board that Liz makes at the drawing board. These are my favorite masks. And the other important party accessory from 2020 is my hand sanitizer. So um, it's a little bittersweet, but um, I just like to acknowledge how incredible it is that the staff of Kellogg Hubbard Library pulled off this uh, virtual fundraising event. Uh, this is our first ever virtual fundraising event and more than 150 people bought tickets tonight. So um, it's just incredible. Um, so thanks everybody um, for, pivoting um, and joining us in this virtual fashion. We've, uh, there's been a lot of great preparation done by the staff um, in advance of this event. Um, and I think we've got things uh, in good shape, but I'll just ask for your patience as we switch back and forth to lots of different music and different speakers, um, but we're excited to, to have everybody here. So again, for folks who are just coming in, um, feel free to introduce yourselves in the chat. Um, and uh, we've got, oh gosh, lots of friends. I wish I could see you uh, in person, but uh, yeah, we'll use the chat. We'll monitor the chat all night. If you wanna say hi to friends, we'll, that's also the place um, where you can chime in with questions for Evan and Garrett, um, uh, our key speakers for the night. So um, I would like to raise a glass um, to begin tonight. Um, uh, and, and I'd like for everyone, grab your, your coffee mug, your seltzer, whatever you have. Um, if we could kick off tonight um, with a toast of gratitude and appreciation for the Kellogg Hubbard Library staff uh, who have not only pivoted to make this event happen, but have spent the year uh, adjusting in all kinds of creative ways uh, to continue to serve their community during this difficult time. So cheers 
to Kellogg Hubbard Library staff. All right. Oh, wow. Look, I'm, I'm uh, obsessed reading this chat. So many people here. Um, it's so great to have you all. So um, it is my great pleasure now to introduce uh, our musical guests, the Zeichner Trio. And uh, they're joining us tonight uh, from their home in Northfield. Yazi, Oliver, and Luli Zeichner are three siblings who've grown up in the hills of Northfield. They play traditional... Oh, they play traditional um, uh, Irish and old time Appalachian music. We've got Luli on four and five string banjos and Celtic harp, Oliver on the penny whistle and the illin pipes and Yazi with fiddle. They're bringing age old melodies alive with creativity and voice and instrument. The group has gained a reputation in Vermont as standard bearers of the tradition. The Zeichners have played at the Vermont History Expo. I think I saw you at the Vermont History Expo. Uh, Farmer's Night at the State House, the New World Festival in Randolph, various venues in Boston. They represented Vermont at the Big E in Springfield, Mass, and performed for the Irish Ambassador's 2018 visit in Vermont. So throughout their musical journey, the siblings have been lucky to live in a state with a vibrant traditional music community, making their music an essential part of the fabric of their lives, and they hope that sharing what they do brings inspiration to you. So with that, welcome Yazi, Oliver, and Luli. Thank you. Okay, we are unmuted. We are unmuted, yes. Hello, everybody. Hope you can hear us. Um, we, Amy said it all. She, she said everything about us. So we will just launch into some music. We're going to play a favorite old-time song of ours called Chili Winds, which kind of appropriate for this time of year, I think.
Thanks to the library for having us play at this event. It's a great honor to play for so many people and it's been a while since we've played for an audience so large because we've been kind of farming all summer and um, not doing concerts. <laughs> yeah. So our next, um, our next set of tunes will be a set of jigs and Lily will play the harp for this. Um, the, this is three jigs that we put together. The first one is called Palm Sunday. The middle one, hmm, what's the middle one called? Don't remember. I don't remember what the middle one's called. <laughs> Maybe by the end of it I'll remember. Um, and the last one is called The Humors of Killarney. You can talk about your instrument. <laughs> sure. Are you and I starting to play that one? So I guess I should mention that um, well, Lily's playing the harp. I'm playing the Irish bagpipes, known as the Illin Pipes, and uh, Yazi is playing the fiddle. And um, we all have been honored to be part of a vibrant Irish traditional music community in central Vermont, um, largely um, to the good works of um, Hilary Farrington and Benedict Kohler. Hilary used to be the director of the Kellogg Hubbard Library, so maybe she's familiar to you and if she's watching hello <laughs> all right you and i want to start on this little second okay. do you want me to come second time yeah. okay yeah.
Google, do you want to introduce the next one? Because you... You found this one. Okay, um, yeah, so the next uh, piece that we'll do is a song called I Will Go With My Father of Plowing. And um, I first heard this from a recording of Ken Hall and Peta Webb. And um, they, I, I think I they, they found it in a book of English songs, but after some research they realized that originally it was an Irish poem by Joseph Campbell. Joseph Campbell, okay. Yes, so yes. That's, yeah. Yes, and I believe the last verse was actually not part of the original poem, but someone set it to music and decided needed a fourth, fourth verse. Maybe if you could give me a note. I will go with my father a plowing to a green field by the sea, and the crows and the rooks and the seagulls will come flocking after me. I will sing. Rejoices in the cleaving chair. I will go with my father a sowing to a red field by the sea, and the crows and the rooks and the starlings will come flocking. breaking down into laughter during that. Yeah, sometimes during close harmony songs we break down laughing and it's not great. And then we can't get out of laughing and so we have to just stop practicing. But fortunately, the song vision of the poem has fewer varieties of birds involved. Apparently the, the original poem by Joseph Campbell has different verses, um, different birds in each verse rather than the repeated ones. Right, we would have gotten so mixed up if yeah. we had to... So can we have a time those. check actually? Do you have sure, we've got, we've got like 
eight more minutes, so I think we've got time for another. Okay, so do a couple things. So I need okay. to go well, to you're tuning room, me. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, All right. Oh right, yeah. So I need to go to the next room over and tune my banjo to a different so key. Can't hear you. <laughs> well, well, the banjo player is banished to the basement temporarily. Yazi and I are going to play a few pieces on the pipes and fiddle. Yeah, we'll pl- we'll start with a, a slip jig that is called Shaheen Chaho, and it's um it comes from a lullaby, an Irish lullaby, and then we'll follow it with a one of our favorite jigs that we we the the Irish session in Montpelier that used to happen on Main Street in Baguitos. Um, this was a popular tune at that session. Could you just the drums? <laughs>
Just in time, our banjo player is back. Hi, Lily. So we're gonna play one, one last thing for you all. It's one of our old favorites. It's called Jubilee, and I got it from my banjo teacher Ted Ingham about eight years ago. I don't know where he got it from, but I do know that um, Jean Ritchie used to sing it, and according to her, it was a song that originated within the Ritchie family. for supporting the Cal Uncovered yeah. Library. Yeah. Wow. Zeichner Trio, that was beautiful. Y'all sounded wonderful. Thank you so much. I know you can't hear it, but just know that there's more than 100 people applauding all through Central Vermont. That was really beautiful. Thank you. Well, um, I hope you all, I know you all enjoyed that. Um, such a great way to be uh, together, even though we're all apart. Um, I just wanted to, I'm enjoying people are saying hi and chiming in on the chat and I encourage you to keep doing that. Uh, and also uh, as you have questions 
uh, for Garrett and Evan, um, please feel free to use the chat. But I did just want to note uh, that uh, you've got a choice to chat with all panelists, which is just a few of us. Um, but if you want to say hi to everybody, please be sure to choose all panelists and attendees so you can say hi to all of your uh, friends and neighbors. There's We've got a great group of people here today. I won't point out everybody, but I'll just say that uh, say hello to one of my favorite people in the world. Catherine Patterson is, is here with us tonight. Catherine, I can't wait to see you again in person one day. So um, also wanted to mention that the online auction is uh, live and rolling. Uh, there's some incredible artwork, some incredible experiences. There's a fishing trip with Steve Gold to Lake Willoughby that I'm sure there's gonna be a bidding war for. So uh, that stays open till nine. Uh, please log in and, and bid often all those proceeds go to support our wonderful library. Uh, so uh, many of you know, I think most of you probably know that we spent the last couple of years um, raising money uh, through a campaign called Give the Library a Lift. And uh, that uh, campaign closed successfully at the end of the year. And uh, Jesse Lynn and library staff have been so busy uh, working on many projects. Um, and I know that so many of you know that a primary very expensive critical project um, in that work uh, was the completion of a new uh, elevator. And uh, I'm pleased to tell you all that uh, as of just a week or so ago, the new elevator is finished. So um, I would like to have our second toast of the e evening. I'd like to lift your glass for the new lift. I'm pointing at it because it's right down the hall that way. Um, and great thanks to all of the donors, uh, to Jesse for years of project management and funding coordination. Uh, we have uh, a new elevator and that's incredible. So here, here to the, new to the new elevator and to everyone who donated and made that possible. Okay, so on to the next uh, part of our show. I am thrilled um, to present Garrett Graff and Evan Osnos. Um, Garrett, uh, Garrett, we've never met, but I've been following you on Twitter for at least five years. Uh, and, uh, and I live down the street from your awesome parents. So um, I'm so happy you're here tonight and that you uh, brought Evan Osnos out uh, to join us tonight. So uh, Garrett probably needs no introduction to many of you, but I'm gonna tell you a little bit um, about his pretty incredible accomplishments. Um, he's a distinguished magazine journalist, best-selling historian and regular TV commentator. He spent more than a dozen years covering pop where we've been and where we're headed. Uh, today, Garrett serves as the director of the Aspen Institute's Cybersecurity and Technology Program and he's a contributor to Wired, Long Reads, and CNN. His most recent book, uh, national bestseller, uh, The Only Plane in the Sky, An Oral History of 9-11, which we, of course, here have here at the library uh, and is also for sale at the wonderful Bear Pond Books right down the street. Um, he's also the, the author of multiple other books, including The First Campaign, Globalization, The Web, and The Race for the White House and the threat matrix inside Robert Mueller's FBI and Raven Rock, which I loved, a national bestseller about the government's Cold War doomsday plans. Um, so inside both journalism and politics, he's got a long history as a new media pioneer. He was the founding editor of Fishbowl. Uh, and during that time, he was the very first blogger admitted to cover a White House press briefing way back in 2005. Um, and that's been noted, his reporter's notebook uh, is on display at the, the museum in, in Washington, in the collections of the museum at Washington, DC. Garrett's a native of Montpelier, of course, a graduate of Harvard, and he served as a deputy national press secretary on Howard Dean's presidential campaign. And beginning in 1997, was then Governor Dean's very first webmaster. Taught at Georgetown for many years, uh, his writing and commentary has appeared in the Washington Post, the Wall Street Journal, uh, Rolling Stone, Politico, uh, and his reporting has been cited on shows ranging from Stephen Colbert to John Oliver and Rachel Maddow. He's the chair of the board of the National Conference on Citizenship, and uh, he serves here in Vermont. He serves on the board of Vermont Public Radio and the Burlington Housing Authority. 
So with that, Garrett, I'm gonna turn it over to you. Uh, take it away. Thank you for being here. Thanks so much, Amy. That was an uh, overly generous uh, and long-winded introduction, but you somehow managed to forget the most important line on my resume, which is I my first job was as a page for the Kellogg Hubbard Library in middle school, reshelving books in the children's room when it was still downstairs. So this uh, is a real honor and a privilege to be back uh, and uh, tonight uh, with uh, the Kellogg Hubbard Library. Um, I, I'm sorry we're not able to all be there in the building having the great food and drink that the gala normally has, um, but I'm pleased that you all are able to join me tonight uh, for uh, what I hope and what I think will be a great conversation with my friend Evan Osnos, um, who has uh, uh, a, a brand new biography out about Joe Biden, the new um, president elect of the United States. Uh, and so I'm interested in tonight to talk to Evan about politics and Joe Biden uh, and a little bit uh, about China as well. Evan um, is, is just a journalist who constantly humbles me both in the style of his writing and the depth and insight of his reporting. He has been a staff writer for The New Yorker since 2008, where he covers politics and foreign affairs. His book, Age of Ambition, Chasing Fortune, Truth, and Faith in the New China, which was based on his eight years of living in Beijing, where he was the Beijing bureau chief for the Chicago Tribune and part of a team that won the 2008 Pulitzer Prize for investigative reporting. The book actually won the 2014 National Book Award and was itself a finalist for the 2015 Pulitzer Prize. And he lives in Washington, D.C. now, where uh, Evan and I also share a uh, unique passion and interest in the world's doomsday plans. Um, my, uh, my book that Amy mentioned about the government side and Evan uh, is the premier world expert on the billionaires bunkers in New Zealand and elsewhere. So uh, you should always pay very close attention to where Evan is speaking to you from at any given moment, because if you ever see him popping up in New Zealand, you should know that you should head for your own basement. Um, Evan, thanks so much for joining us tonight um, here at the Kellogg Hubbard Library. Uh, it's a great pleasure to be with you. Thanks, Garrett, for the invitation for a great cause. I hope you guys can hear me okay. So we can hear you just fine. So um, let me dive in tonight um, and, and let's start talking a little bit about Joe Biden and, and this election. Um, your, um, your book, uh, is called The Life, The Run, and What Matters Now. Um, and, and I thought we would actually talk a little bit about each portion of that. Um, it, it, Joe Biden, as you say in the book, uh, has become sort of an area of accidental expertise for you. Um, this is not anyone that you ever expected to go out and write a biography of, but you have covered him pretty extensively for much of the last decade um, and interviewed him on multiple occasions as vice president uh, and uh, even uh, as recently as this summer. Um, I, I wonder if you could sort of give us some sense of, of what Joe Biden is like that, it, that might surprise people. I mean, sort of part of what makes him so interesting uh, as a public figure right now is he is in some ways one of the best known politicians we have in America. This is someone who's been in politics for 45 years uh, on, uh, in a high profile way. Um, as you wrote um, about uh, in, in your biography of him, this is someone who was actually profiled at length in Richard Ben Kramer's 1988 or book about the 1998 
1988 presidential race, What It Takes, um, and a book that you know you and I both grew up sort of reading uh, as you know one of the great campaign books of all time, only to see this guy sort of pop back up almost 40 years later um, and actually now finally achieve his lifelong dream of becoming president. So uh, we all think we know Joe Biden really well. What, from your experience, actually being with him would surprise us about him? Yeah, well, it's, you know what's fun, I have to say, Garrett, doing an event like this with you is a treat because in ordinary circumstances, you and I would be having precisely this conversation, you know, over a cup of coffee in human form. And instead, we're having it this way, but it's also fun to be doing it um, with a group in this way. So, look, the fact is, when I say I became a sort of accidental expert on Joe Biden, it was for precisely the reason you described, which is that in many ways, he was part of the political furniture. I mean, he'd been around for so long that a lot of people didn't pay that much attention to him. And then I came to Washington in 2013, and to be perfectly blunt about it, he was not the person that everybody was dying to see. And I was sort of new to the politics game. I'd seen him in China. That's where I'd become interested in him. And uh, the reason I became interested was because of his approach to diplomacy, which was kind of unusual. He was very candid when he talked to Chinese leaders. And then I came to Washington and the, the sort of, the, the kind of cool reporters, the ones who really knew what was going on, really weren't spending a lot of time with Joe Biden. He was not a hard interview to get. And I didn't know anything. And I thought this guy knows about foreign affairs. He's involved in national security in a really serious way. And I'm interested in those issues. I'm gonna go start interviewing him. And what I discovered was, of course, he was interested in foreign affairs. He was involved, as he said, you know, um, that uh, he said, President Obama sends me to the places he doesn't wanna go. And that meant he spent a lot of time in, in places like Iraq and Ukraine and elsewhere. But it also meant that by talking to him about foreign affairs, I began to understand a lot more about American politics. Because the thing about Joe Biden that is very rewarding as an interviewee, or rewarding for the interviewer, is that he can't help but tell you what he actually thinks. Sure, he does some spinning, everybody spins in Washington, but he doesn't put a whole lot of effort into it, to be perfectly honest about it. And you and I both know there are some people in Washington who are seamless in the way that they sort of lead you down the path to what it is that they want you to believe. Biden either doesn't bother anymore, or he doesn't, frankly, sort of spend that much focus on it. And as a result, you end up coming away with a tremendous amount of insight. I'll give you one example. When I was talking to him once in about 2014 in his office at the West Wing, he started saying, this is before Donald Trump was on the scene. It was before Bernie Sanders was a phenomenon and helping us kind of reframe what was happening in politics. And Biden said, look, I think the Democratic Party is making a big mistake right now and losing a lot of people in the working class because it's not paying attention to issues of economic fairness. And he said this to me a couple of years before the election, and to be honest, I didn't think, I didn't understand what he had figured out, which was something was, was changing in politics. Um, but the thing to directly answer your question, the thing that I think would surprise people in spending time with him kind of one-on-one -on -one is that he is what I would describe as productively insecure, by which I mean he is constantly on the lookout for things he doesn't know. A lot of times when you interview somebody, a politician who has reached the highest ranks of their business in their eighth decade, they are generally kind of um, confident that they know what they need to know. And he doesn't project that. And we can talk about why. I think there's some interesting sort of biographical reasons. But he is constantly trying to figure out what's going on. In my case, he's asking about China. He wants to sort of think about what he doesn't hear when he's in his usual uh, routines. And he's doing that to everybody. And so he is kind of slurping up information uh, in, a, in a way that I think is relatively unusual for somebody in his position. 
Um, so you, you have this quote in uh, your book that just sort of really stuck with me, given the trajectory of where the country is right now, where you say, uh, quote from him, people say to me, what are you going to do if you get elected? And he says, it depends on what the hell I'm left with. Not a joke. I'm not being a wise guy. Things could get a lot worse. And that was from the summer when we thought things were rather bad in the country and we are now in far worse shape uh, it, on the pandemic front. Um, the jobs report this week shows sort of a yawning gap on the economy. Um, and this is, uh, all sort of leaving aside a series of actions that we are seeing President Trump take uh, from you know, Steve Mnuchin to the Pentagon to uh, DHS uh, that are sort of salting the earth that Joe Biden is going to inherit on January 20th at noon. And I'm curious, um, you know, how do you think Joe Biden is looking at this? Um, and, and then, you know, the, the second half of the question is, in a weird way, this is the second time in 12 years that the country has asked Joe Biden to pull itself uh, out of a massive, seemingly once a generation, once a century economic collapse. And, and what lessons do you think from taking office in 2008, 2009, do you think Joe Biden is going to bring to trying to tackle this pandemic and this economic catastrophe? Yeah, to your first question, what's interesting is, you know, in that quote that he said to me, he said, it is gonna get very, very ugly. And he was referring to both the nature of the campaign, and of course, we saw that unfold in those final months, but also his concern, and he sensed that the president, uh, now the outgoing president, was going to fundamentally um, mishandle the virus. It was happening already, but his sense was this thing is going to get worse, and when it does the president's not up to the task. And this gets to the sort of fundamental reason of why he got into this race, which is to say he looked at the state of play in 20, it was truly 2015, and sorry, uh, I should say it was 20, uh, 2017, 2018. And he said, uh, this is a moral emergency. It's not just, I mean, initially he thought this is a matter of incompetence, but then he thought there's something deeper going on, which is that um, he thought it was actually a fundamental effort to undermine the functioning of the U.S. government and of democracy. And so it, it became for him larger than a project of just trying to adequately run the government. So then you get to this current scenario where you have, uh, you know, the, the White House and Republican leadership in the Congress essentially unable to come up with uh, a deal that Democrats would agree to that would provide even basic relief for people in serious trouble right now. You have obviously uh, an effort in a variety of ways, whether it's by initiating further drilling contracts in the Arctic or uh, continuing to build the wall. There's this effort to try to sort of govern from beyond the grave a bit and establish things in motion that the Biden administration will find it hard to undo. You know, one of the comments, it was a quote recently from somebody in the Trump, uh, in the Trump administration who said basically the strategy is light so many small fires around the world here in the United States and elsewhere that there's too much for them to be able to put out right away. So that's the state of play that a Biden administration confronts. And Biden brings to it a couple of instincts, a couple of strategies. Um, number one is his belief, and it's worth reminding ourselves, in 2009 when he came and after all, he was tasked, as you kind of alluded to in your question, with implementing the stimulus bill. It was one of the things that uh, President Obama asked him to do. But even before that, actually, and this gets to the question of how he'll handle this moment, he was asked to try to get some votes. They needed votes in order to pass the bill. In fact, they, uh, they didn't have it. And so he called six members of Congress, and he got 
three yes votes and the bill passed by three votes. So his view is that, uh, you know, and this gets to his sort of broader philosophy, is that he is uh, somebody who fundamentally is a politician in the clutch. He likes in being in close. He likes those kinds of conversations. He's constantly on the telephone. At one point, people pulled his phone records during the vice presidency, and he was making more phone calls than other people had been in that job. Um, he kept his locker at the gym in the Senate, even when he was in the vice presidency, because he liked to go down there and just kibitz. That's, that's in his nature. So his approach to the moment is, uh, as you know, look, his approach legislatively, if it's possible, depends on the composition of the Senate, um, is to genuinely go big and go bold. That's what Jake Sullivan than said to me not too long ago, uh, meaning they're not going to do the usual, let's do a kind of sort of pace out what we can do over the first two years before the midterms. Their view is that's not this moment and that's not the politics. We have to go very fast, do things almost immediately. Um, if they don't have the Congress, and it looks like they may not, then I think you're more likely to see what somebody in the transition said to me as plan B, which is scorched earth. And they don't want that to be the case. We can talk about why Biden believes unity is possible, or at least some negotiated compromises are possible. But if they need to, they are a seasoned group and they know how to use the levers of the executive branch. Things, for instance, like setting priorities within individual departments about what do you prosecute, what do you not prosecute, what do you make an issue, what do you not make an issue. Or, for instance, um, how do you spend your money? So uh, you can decide that you're going to buy sustainable technologies, electric vehicles, things like that. So you may not be able to get Congress to agree to a fundamental climate change uh, program, but you can use inside the departments that power to get things done. All of this is to say that Joe Biden doesn't have a magic wand, and he goes into this with, um, I think, the most important thing to, to know about his approach at this moment is that he is humbled by the awesome task ahead of him. And it is not a celebratory mood when you talk to uh, his people right now these days. And even when I was talking to him before the election, he was in a grave state of mind. And that's what's striking to me, Garrett. I mean, you and I both have sort of followed Joe Biden's career over the course of his evolution. And if you had talked to him in the years when Richard Ben Kramer in 1987, 88 was spending time with Joe Biden, you wouldn't have described him as a grave person. You wouldn't have described him as a deeply serious, deeply serious man. And that's what he is right now. He is, I think, um, he is appropriately grave about what they're facing. We saw after the uh, election a, a bunch of stories about his long, uh, you know, warm working relationship with Mitch McConnell um, that uh, were followed about 24 hours after those stories ran by Mitch McConnell refusing to acknowledge that he was the president elect at all. Um, I, and I'm curious. Handicap where you see that relationship going um, if Mitch McConnell remains the majority leader in the Senate. Um, how much do you think Joe Biden is actually going to be able to work with McConnell and make the deals that Joe Biden sort of thinks in his mind he is destined to make? Honestly, it depends more on Mitch McConnell than it does on Joe Biden. And it's worth reminding people that they do have more of a relationship than certainly Mitch McConnell and Barack Obama had, or even Mitch McConnell and Donald Trump. I mean, interestingly, Mitch McConnell was the only Republican senator who attended Bo Biden's funeral in 2015. Um, there was this fateful moment, we all remember, in the Obama administration when we were facing this fiscal cliff crisis, the possibility of the US defaulting on its debt. And uh, the president and McConnell's people had been unable to make a deal. And McConnell called over to the West Wing, called over to 
Biden's office and Biden picks up and McConnell says, is there anybody over there who knows how to make a deal? So, you know, these two, and they ended up then striking a deal, which it's worth reminding ourselves, Harry Reid was not a fan of that deal. In fact, it said that he crumpled it up and threw it in the fireplace. I asked Harry Reid about it. He said, no, that, that didn't happen. I used to throw other things in the fireplace, but not that. Um, now, they, Biden is committed to the idea. He fundamentally believes that it is possible to reach some negotiated solutions right now with, uh, with Republicans on things that are things that are just so obviously urgently necessary, uh, like COVID relief. But here's the thing. Biden does not pretend for a minute, he doesn't believe that Mitch McConnell is going to do something out of sheer kind of sentimental goodwill for Biden or for anybody else. He, he believes, and this gets to his core theory of political affairs, is that people only do things because of interests, because of their calculation and perception of their interests. And his belief is that part of the reason why the Obama administration struggled sometimes to get things uh, to get things done with Republicans was that they were so appalled, rightly in many cases, uh, with the conduct of their opponents that they would go into the room and more or less say, "Here's why you're wrong, and here's where you're coming at this from a fundamentally flawed perspective." Biden believes whether you're negotiating something in Wilmington, Delaware, or in Baghdad or in Beijing, you can't do that. And he's talked to me about why it, you know if he sometimes frustrates diplomats because they say, you're not, you're not saying what we want you to say. And he says, because a lot of the things you tell me to say, communicate to the other guy that I think he's an idiot. And I'm not going to do that. That's his language, not mine. And so what he's likely to do is to go in and say to Mitch McConnell, I understand why you think it is in your interest to shut me down, to make my administration as unproductive and as stymied as possible. It's what you did to Obama. But here's why I think that's a mistake for you and your party. Whether or not he's going to succeed in that argument is another story. But it is, it's important to identify that he, and I think the key player here is also Mike Donilon, who is now one of his senior advisors in the White House. Uh, but Mike Donilon has been with, he was the strat chief strategist of the campaign. He's been with uh, Joe Biden uh, for as long as Biden's been in this game. And, and Donilon and Biden both believe that, that there has been some sort of failure of, of, of the strategy of negotiation over the last few years, and they're determined to try to subvert that. Um, you wrote a piece in The New Yorker um, a, a month ago about pulling American democracy back from the brink. Um, and uh, this last month, as every month seems to be in 2020, it was about six years long. Um, and it, it feels in some ways that uh, we are even closer to the brink in American democracy now than we were when your piece ran. Um, I, I'm curious, you know, you, you talked about in the piece, uh, you know, the, the question, what would it take to pull American politics out of the fire to make democracy more functional and trustworthy and to make Americans feel in any real sense that we are all in this together. Um, having written the piece, having looked at, uh, talked to all of the people that you, you talked to for that piece, um, and, and now sort of having watched this last month unfold, um, what's your own answer to that question? You, you know, how, how well do you think America can pull back from the brink of democracy right now? And what's the path that the country needs to take to get there? Well, I think the way I would describe the moment that we're facing, and this was sort of the motive of that, the motivation behind that piece, was that it feels like we are choosing between two paths of the American political tradition. And the American political tradition is not sweet and simple. It is a combination of both moments of reason and moments of violence. And when you go back, and what I sort of wanted to do was to remind ourselves that when you go back, you have uh, this conception that we were founded very much under the banner of, of the Enlightenment. We were, after all, a country conceived in you know, what Franklin called reason's eye, the idea that you could govern um, 
you could be unburdened by the divine right of kings and by the sort of allegiance to the deities, that that was how we were going to function as a country. But at the same moment that we were marching down that path, we were also beset constantly by this tradition of political violence. I mean, the example that I sort of refer to is that the Lincoln-Douglas debates right there on the eve of the Civil War was in many ways the high point of political rhetoric of the 19th century. You had Lincoln who just by sort of sheer moral clarity was able to establish himself on the national stage. At that point, he was just running for the Illinois, he was running to be a senator from Illinois and in fact lost that race. But uh, the yeah, years later when people would ask him, what do you believe, what do you stand for? He would say, just read the transcripts of the Lincoln-Douglas debates. And what we know was that even though, of course, it was the high point of political dialogue and discourse, it also didn't prevent the Civil War two years later. And it also, of course, did not prevent Lincoln's assassination. And so you have these two halves of our kind of Janus-faced character politically. And right now, it feels to us like we are teetering, very much so, uh, between these two. The data is, is, is quite... Um, is is quite chilling. When you look at the uptick in the number of people who describe their opponents as illegitimate, uh, people who say that some portion of the people who disagree with them should just die, this is not my language, this is survey data coming out of very serious scholarship. And that worries us. I mean, when you look at the measures of political cohesion, things like trust in law enforcement, trust in the political system, all of those measures have dropped dramatically, and not just by our own standards, but by international standards. Um, so then we're faced with this question. And I will say that when I was writing this piece, it was just before the election, all of us, you and I both, I know uh, particularly, were thinking about the risks of political violence. What would happen if these militia groups came out and said that they were going to prevent the counting of ballots? What if they said that they were going to you know, use force to try to uh, reject a legitimate democratic result. And that didn't happen. And instead, what we saw was that at the top of the Republican Party, Mitch McConnell, obviously, and others um, followed Donald Trump's lead in this fantasy, this delusion that he won the election, or at least not acknowledging Joe Biden's legitimate win. But what you also saw was that in these key small moments, it was, I mean, it's bizarre to, to really to think of it, that the, the slide into what could have been a real uh, constitutional collapse, was, it, was, it was arrested by individuals, people like the Republican Secretary of State of Georgia and these individual state lawmakers in Michigan. That is a I would say a fragile foundation on which to, uh, for us to build our confidence in the democratic system right now. But it did hold for the moment. And that gives us an, an indication of the fact that we are, we are tugged between these two. But what I came away with, and I think it's also directly relevant for tonight's event, is that when I started talking to people for what we think of as kind of act three of a magazine piece like that, uh, you know, your long piece of that kind in the New Yorker, you typically, you frame out the problem, you then talk about what the scholars are thinking about how we got here, and then we have to think about where do we go. And in that third part, I talked to some really interesting and thoughtful people, people like Robert Putnam uh, at Harvard, who is, uh, you know, somebody who, who has thought for a very long time about things like social capital and what makes us citizens, not just residents of a republic and a democracy. How do we actually sort of relate to one another? And there was a really interesting project which didn't get enough attention at the time. And I think uh, people would find it interesting to read done by the American Academy of Arts and Sciences mm -hmm. in which they looked at this. They said, what are some of these steps that we could actually take to restore American reason and political uh, decency. There are things like, for instance, some of it is you know, harder to do than others, things like expand the House of Representatives so that it would more accurately reflect the composition of the country. That would then, in fact, also have an impact on the Electoral College. Um, but I think um, one of the things that they also mentioned, and those are procedural steps, 
But one of the things they also mentioned are things like libraries. As they said to me, you know, one of the in interesting details is that there are more libraries in America than there are Starbucks locations. And libraries are the laboratory of democracy, after all. They are the building block of that civic culture. It's where you go and learn how to disagree. It's where you go and learn how to absorb ideas that are contrary to your assumptions, that might challenge you. And they are also the places where we can put people into conversation with each other who might otherwise have very different lifestyles. Part of the subtext of that report was that you know, one of the origins of our unreason is our seclusion, what Putnam called bowling alone, our withdrawal from, uh, from our collective experiences. And libraries and other pieces of what are so accurately described as the civic architecture, those really are the kinds of places where you get people back into um, sort of nonviolent confrontation of ideas. And that's one of the ways that you can begin to rebuild this. But let's have no illusions. It is, we are, still very much in the grip of that of that dilemma that choice that americans are making and i think we will be for quite some time i'm afraid um for all of you watching at home uh tonight uh uh feel free to put questions into the chat a couple of you i've seen already do that um we'll we'll work in some of those over the next uh, 20 minutes or so as we continue this conversation. Um, Evan, I'm curious when you look at the steps that uh, Biden has taken in the month or so since uh, it became clear he was going to be the president elect, um, is there anything that you are seeing him do that is surprising to you? Well, one of the things is that he has, over the course of the last year, continuing right up until this moment, um, he has resisted some of the temptation to freak out. And that is an interesting thing. I mean, in his campaign, there were moments when they were so close to losing that uh, actually one of his senior aides told me the story that she called him and he was on the train on his way from, uh, from Delaware to New York. And she said, look, we are so, we're so low on money uh, because nobody wants to give us any right now because they think we're doomed that we may have to shut down in a week. And if we do, you need to hold on to enough money so that you can pay people severance. That's how close it was to the end. And I asked her, I said, how did he respond to that? I mean, there's a lot of ways, you know, people can sort of rage at the heavens. There are some who will then blame their staff. I, you know, there's, there's a lot of ways you can handle that. And his answer to that was actually sort of uh, quite calm. I mean, as he said to me and he said to others, I've lost more than that in my life. And that's a different kind of um, calm and that you need when you're facing an outgoing president who is actively trying to subvert the, um, the legitimacy of the democratic process. But what you've heard from the very moment, from the morning after the election, was an effort to not allow themselves to be pulled in to the illusion of a controversy, to the illusion, the creation, the invention of, uh, of a dispute. There was no dispute. The votes were clear. The law was clear. This was something that was being manufactured by the president. And in order for it to have any kind of life, Biden needed to engage, and he didn't. And what I was surprised by was that level of discipline, that saying, and some of this is not just him, this is people around him. I mean, interestingly, Ron Klain, of course, who is now the incoming chief of staff, when Ron Klain was the Ebola czar in the Obama administration, he had a saying, which was, ignore the noise. And that was a time when people were getting scared. The virus was coming to the United States. There was a lot of fear about whether Ebola was going to be handled well. And his message internally inside the office was ignore the noise, focus on what we need to do. And you heard something very similar these days in the Biden camp because their belief has been that we need to keep marching forward, convey a sense that we are in fact confident 
that we're going to be able to take office on January 20th. We're not taking it lightly. There was a lot of kicking beneath the surface of the water. They were doing a lot in court. They were actively contesting every single one of these lawsuits, but they never allowed the public to believe that this was fundamentally in doubt. And that what surprised me about it, as I said, was discipline, because the Joe Biden of 30 years ago, the one that Richard Ben Kramer wrote so well about, was not a disciplined candidate. In fact, he was not a disciplined uh, senator. He was making mistakes. And I think he is, at this point in his life, finally ready, actually. Uh, and he would say as much. You know, He was asked once why he bombed out of the 87, 88 race. And it took him a long time to acknowledge this. But he said, I was... I wasn't ready to be president. And these days, and this gives me comfort, I say this as a, as a citizen, as a dad, uh, he is ready. And I, and I, am, I am feeling quite, uh, quite good about this person and this group that is going into office. Um, I, I do think that that's a, it's a fascinating insight, um, Evan, that jives with sort of all of my experiences you know, in and around politics as well, which is, uh, you know, for as awful and weird and strange as presidential races usually are, uh, they actually do a really good job of sorting out sort of who is ready, you know, organizationally, discipline-wise, um, you know, sort of mature enough, intellectually engaged enough to actually make it through that process. Um, and one of the things that comes out in, in your book is, you know, just how hard it was um, when Biden took over with Obama in 2008, 2009, the challenges that they faced. Um, and, and even really, you know, Joe Biden ran for president then also, um, you know, he was out there in 06, 07, uh, running, um, did terribly and was sort of plucked by Obama from, you know, what, what all of us in Washington at the, at the moment sort of assumed was, you know, the twilight of Joe Biden's career um, to be vice president that summer. And he came in as vice president sort of assuming that he was going to be, you know, the smart, wise one. And then was, uh, as you lay out in the book, sort of deeply humbled by Barack Obama's approach to the economic crisis, the decisions that he made. And, and one of the lessons that he made, which goes to sort of that Ron Klain, ignore the noise um, philosophy that, that marked so much of the way that Obama led was you know, you just got to make the hard decisions and make them for the right reasons and, you know, move on. And that's really what being a leader is about. Um, when you look ahead over the next couple of months, what do you think the hardest decision that Joe Biden is going to actually have to make is? And I, I, I sort of suspect it's, it's actually going to end up being less pandemic and more uh, 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 basically, how much do we relitigate the Trump years for the next four years? I mean, do you uh, do you prosecute Donald Trump? Do you prosecute his family? Do you attempt to sort of relitigate uh, all of these issues? Um, and, and I'm curious if, if you agree with that, or, or you think you know there's something else out there like the pandemic that will actually prove to be the hardest part for Biden. Yeah, it's a really interesting thing. I mean, he is, um, he's torn between these two impulses. I mean, I know for a fact that he is torn between, on the one hand, recognizing that there are a lot of people who believe that the Obama administration did not do enough to hold people accountable after the financial crisis or after uh, the use of torture uh, in the war on terror. And, you know, there is a feeling that they, in the interest of moving forward, helping the country uh, take hard steps, that they created, uh, it was a sort of unfinished chapter there. Biden knows that. And at the same time, he believes that he has to make a decisive break from what 
the Trump era represented in the Justice Department, which was the total politicization of prosecution. And so he's determined personally to stay out of it because he believes that one of the, you know, it was a signature Trump thing to use the powers of the government and the, and the threat of, of sending somebody to jail as an element of political and personal power. And he doesn't want to do that. So his approach is to do something sort of um, you know, at the gentler end of the spectrum. What he's saying now is we are going to establish an inspector general to, off the bat who's going to look into all of the spending around COVID. And if that person at office discovers examples of things that can be referred to the Justice Department, they'll do it. In which case, then they become uh, they become uh, at matters for prosecution. But I don't think that actually this is the hardest call for him. I think the hardest decision that Biden is going to face is the decision about when to essentially pull the ripcord and decide that there is no way to make deals with the Republicans, that there, there is no possibility for negotiated compromise, and I have to do what I can to use his, you know, his advisor's term to me, go scorched earth. That I think is gonna be harder for him. You know, I had an interview, I interviewed President Obama for the book not too long ago, and you know, what he said to me was that, he said, look, I think it's been painful, that was his word, for Joe to watch the dysfunction of the Senate, because after all, he came up at a time when the Senate was functional and it had much smaller degree of political polarization. And parting with that has been, has been difficult. So I actually think that's, that may be the thing because part of it is not just politics and rhetorical for Biden to run on the idea that he'll be able to make some, make some kind of negotiated uh, headway. He really believes it. And I think if he finds that it's not possible that uh, taking that off ramp is gonna be the hardest choice he'll make. Um, so I wanna turn to a, a couple of the questions from the audience tonight. Um, it, and pull together uh, two of them. Um, one that's asking about uh, how Biden might deploy Kamala Harris, um, particularly knowing as he does what it's like to be a vice president and what it's uh, and what it's like to be a vice president that actually has influence and is included in in conversations. Um, and, and then similarly, um, you know who knows where America will be in four years, um, but does not seem likely that Joe Biden will be running for re-election in 2024. Um, where do you sort of see Kamala fitting into this puzzle and how does she use the next four years uh, in the Naval Observatory in Washington? Yeah, I find this a really interesting subject too because you know, the thing is, he, after all, comes to this uh, having formed his own theory of the case on, on vice presidencies. And what he said was he determined, he, he figured out early on uh, that actually it was, it was a job, but only if the president made it one. Look, let's remind ourselves, he didn't want the job initially. He actually said no. Um, and then it was his wife, uh, Dr. Jill Biden, who said to him, more or less, look, what's wrong here? What are you like? Why wouldn't you do this? And he said, look, I, I don't I don't think I can have a. I don't think I can. Uh, I don't think I want this job. You know, there's a long history of people sort of maligning the vice presidency. And she said, you got into politics partly to try to advance civil rights. And you also got into this. Uh, you've been saying you want to end this war in Iraq that you voted for. Um, so why wouldn't you do it? This is a chance to do it. And, and he said, but I don't know if I can, how am I going to work for somebody? I haven't had a boss in 40 years. And she said, grow up. So he then got into the job and discovered that the job is only as good as your president allows it to be. And he thought it was important and he will make this vice presidency important, but it's a different job. He needs different things from it. What he did for Obama was partly foreign affairs, as I mentioned before, but also partly a link to Congress. He, after all, loved being over on the Hill, Obama did not. Obama did not enjoy his time in the Senate and didn't want to spend his time um, getting a drink with Mitch McConnell, uh, to borrow an old, an old joke of his. And, and Biden doesn't need that from 
Kamala Harris. He has more experience on the Hill and, and uh, doesn't need her particularly on foreign affairs. What he needs her so much, emphatically, clearly, is as a bridge to a larger community of Americans. I mean, she is able to, obviously, she is a multiple uh, series of firsts in her job, uh, not only as a woman, but also as an African-American and as a child of immigrants. And he knows that he is not the person that a lot of Democrats wanted to be president, much less 70 million Americans who voted for Donald Trump. And his belief, it's quite deeply held, is that he needs to both speak to this broader community and also absorb the ideas of people who may not look like him. He is, you know, he doesn't put it quite this way, but he, he knows he's an old white guy and he has to do a much better job of understanding what the experiences are of people out in the country if he's going to succeed as president. Now, the question of what happens in four years is, this is not being coy. He does not know. It is not a case that he is going into this determined to only serve one term. I think actually, you know, I pushed around on this a bit in the reporting uh, because you'd heard these little indicators that maybe he was only going to serve one term. And I, you know, the truth was, he doesn't politically it would be malpractice for him to acknowledge that at this point because then he becomes a lame duck immediately but i think more likely he's going to decide in the second or third year whether he's still got enough gas in the tank to do it if i was kamala harris one of the key things that i would be thinking about is that he takes a lot of pride in the fact that he did not run for president uh kind of on the side while serving Barack Obama. He takes pride in having been essentially a kind of faithful deputy because the oldest psychodrama in Washington is a vice president kind of running a crypto candidacy, uh, driving the president nuts while they're seeking the next office. And he likes the fact that he didn't do that. And so I think Kamala Harris is, is, is certainly wise enough to sense that her path to success as a vice president and therefore eventually perhaps as president is to do the job as it is, help him succeed as president, and when the time comes, um, get that slingshot uh, effect of being uh, in the poll position if she wants it. But, but if she moves too fast, that's actually the way that that undermines that potential. Um, let, me, let me ask two more questions um, before we run out of time tonight. Um, the, this has been wonderful, and I'm really, really appreciative of you sharing your wisdom. And uh, I, uh, as, as you know, we could go on all night as we have uh, before when it has been just sitting in a bar together. Um, so speaking of people who didn't want Joe Biden to be president um, in the Democratic Party, uh, we are pretending tonight that we are sitting on stage together in Montpelier, Vermont, uh, the home state of Bernie Sanders. Um, and Bernie uh, seems uh, like he is sort of continuing to play his role as a crotchety dissenter in the Democratic Party, um, announcing that he is not going to potentially not support the COVID relief bill that's coming together um, because it doesn't go far enough. Um, we've talked a lot tonight about how Barack, uh, sorry, how Joe Biden's going to bridge to the Republicans. How do you see Joe Biden sort of bridging to the Bernie movement in the Democratic Party, which in many ways represents, you know, the next generation of the Democratic Party? Um, you know, when you look at, uh, you know, the the that very historic, you know, seventy two or ninety six hours in. Uh, it, it, earlier this year, where it looked like Bernie was actually going to run away with the Democratic uh, nomination in the same way that Donald Trump did the Republican one by just uh, splitting the rest of the party's vote among Pete Buttigieg and Amy Klobuchar and Joe Biden um, and the others before the rest of the party congealed very quickly around Joe Biden and delivered him the nomination. Um, how much repair work does Joe Biden have to do there? Um, and, and how do you see him, you know, just even bridging within his own party, let alone 
before he gets to the Republicans? Well, it's it's worth in some ways quoting Bernie Sanders on this subject. I think you know what what Bernie was asked uh, during the campaign. You know, why did you endorse Biden so much faster than you had endorsed Hillary? And what Bernie said was, look, to be frank about it, he said. Uh, he said, I have a much better relationship with Joe Biden than I had with Hillary Clinton, not personally, meaning he is more open to listening to me and my ideas. He doesn't agree with me on everything. I don't expect that he will, but he takes them, he takes them on in a way that I sense. And that's one of the reasons why you then saw him become a more enthusiastic advocate. And then you saw the formation of these task forces, which could have been, you know, baloney, but this was the real thing. This was the, you know, essentially Bernie's camp and Biden's camp coming together and forming on issues like climate, uh, the economy, and so on. And, you know, I talked to, a, you know, people who were on those task forces, one climate activist in particular, who said to me, uh, this is, you know, somebody named Varshini Prakash, who's a young, very kind of really impressive um, climate activist, one of the co-founders of the Sunrise Movement. And she said, I came into there very wary. And what I discovered was that actually John Kerry, who was the co-chair of this thing, along with AOC, that they were more open to hearing from people like me than I thought they were. I did not get out of there. I didn't get them to sign on to the Green New Deal. I didn't expect them to. But she said, you know, my goal, my task before me uh, in a Biden presidency, and I remember this expression always, I think of it a lot these days, is I have to find a path between complacency and, and not fighting and being righteous and uh, and closing off the possibility for progress, even if it's not all of the progress I want. So in a way, it's this combination of things. Biden has to project to the left a sense that he is not regarding them as the enemy, that he is not regarding them as irrelevant, that he doesn't think that his mandate does not include them. He, and it's, it, it has to be sincere. I think people will feel that it doesn't have meaning if he's not responding to it. Some of that will come down to personnel as it always does. And the reality is, look, if he's dealing with a Republican Senate, he's probably not gonna be naming Bernie Sanders as labor secretary. Um, he may not have been doing it anyway, even if he had a Democratic Senate. He is at his core a centrist, but there are a lot of other jobs besides the cabinet and what we need to be looking for is to see who are getting those sub cabinet positions and whether they do represent a diversity of voices. It's worth pointing out that some of his early appointments have been well received on the left. Uh, Janet Yellen, uh, after all, is, is somebody who is known for her focus on unemployment, on labor. Um, uh, there are others, whether even on climate, somebody like John Kerry has been cheered by a progressive climate activist. So, they're making careful choices, and they may not all of them satisfy what people really want at the most ambitious end of the party. Um, but it will be this, it will be something closer to a center, a, a centrist, a centrist line that is open and respectful of views on the left. So and then last question, tonight. this, this is uh, it, one of the longest and meatiest conversations I've had in a long time that doesn't focus primarily on Donald Trump. Uh, but I, we can't get out of the evening without a question uh, about him. Um, we've talked about the 2024 landscape on the Democratic side. Um, it looks like Donald Trump is probably not going to attend Biden's inauguration. Um, I sort of never suspected that he would um, and have been predicting that he will uh, probably hold a you know 2024 re-election campaign kickoff rally at noon on January 20th and somewhere in Florida. Um, where do you see Donald Trump going over these next couple of years? Um, how much of a hold do you think he's going to keep on the Republican Party? Um, and, and how do you think the Republican Party moves forward to 2024? Look, he is clearly right now and will be on January 21st, the day he's gone. Um, he is the dominant figure in Republican politics, full stop. And 
what he is also contending with is a future that will be very, very complicated. He is under investigation in multiple jurisdictions. That is going to be a not insignificant issue for him. I mean, that's not, they're a long way from the question of whether, you know, Donald Trump ever goes to jail. That's not what we're talking about. But that will become a consuming fact of his life, is contending with some of those, if in fact those become uh, the kind of cases that they appear to be. This is why he, you hear him uh, talking, uh, as we're being told, about the possibility of preemptively pardoning his kids and his lawyer and perhaps himself. So I would put that in the column of things he's going to have to be thinking about. The other thing is that it, there are a lot of up and coming Republican leaders uh, who are not all that thrilled about the idea of Donald Trump squatting on the party for the next four years. People who are not short of self-confidence and ambition, uh, people like Josh Hawley and Tom Cotton, who had been envisioning a future that, was, that had more room to run. So I wouldn't assume that they are going to sit quietly uh, and allow that to uh, allow Donald Trump to make all the choices he wants to make. The third thing I would mention is power has a way of leeching out of a person faster than they sometimes assume when they lose the instruments of authority. Donald Trump's signature becomes legally inoperative at noon on January 20th. And that's going to change who he is. We already feel it just in our own conversations around the dinner table. I think you see just your own reaction when you see the tweets. It feels different. It doesn't feel like quite as meaningful and as serious as it did even a few weeks ago. That's going to become more pronounced. You know, he has to deal with the risk of the Sarah Palin problem, which is he ends up essentially as an entertainer. And in his case, it'll be on a scale that's nothing like we've ever seen before. You know, I only sort of half jokingly imagine that he will create a presidential library to return us to our venue for the evening, uh, in which it will be more like a convention center. It'll be a kind of Graceland uh, style destination. And that's where he will hold court from somewhere in Florida. And I think um, the idea that he runs for president again in 24, 2024 is a long way away. I by no means assume it will be the case. I don't think it, it, it's, it's guaranteed to be another Trump family member. I think you have a lot of pretty uh, earnest Republican candidates who believe that it is their turn, particularly after a one-term president being driven from office with historic low levels of favorability. Evan, thank you so much for joining us tonight. Your book, Joe Biden, The Life, The Run, and What Matters Now, available at Bear Pond Books in downtown Montpelier, and of course, from the Kellogg Hubbard Library. Um, it's been a pleasure talking with you tonight, uh, Evan, and thank you to the Kellogg Hubbard Library. And uh, don't forget, uh, all of you watching, to go online and bid on that online auction uh, for the next 54 minutes. Back to you, Amy. Kara and Evan, thank you so much. This was really fascinating and insightful. Uh, we, yeah, I could listen to y'all talk for a lot longer. Thank you. And Garrett, uh, as you were mentioning uh, your, the start of your career here at the Kellogg Hubbard Library, I just kept thinking, sitting here in the fiction room, I feel like we should have a, a Kellogg Hubbard Library page hall of fame, right? On one of these walls here. Uh, so maybe that's, Maybe that's a new new project. So it, it really, it means a lot uh, to us, Evan and Garrett, that you took the time uh, to spend with us tonight. Uh, really, thank you so much. Um, uh, so we're at the end of the party. And uh, as Garrett mentioned, we've got 53 minutes left on that online auction. Uh, there's some really great items there. So I encourage you to bid. Um, it's no uh, surprise to anyone to hear that it's a challenging year uh, to be raising funds uh, for our library. And as Evan mentioned, public libraries are critical for the social fabric of our country. So I know all of you tonight know that. So um, thank you for all of your support of our wonderful library. Um, and uh, I wanna thank Garrett and Evan again, uh, but I also wanna thank the committee who put this first virtual fundraising party together. Um, Carolyn Brennan and Jesse Lynn are awesome co-directors. Our board member, uh, Judy Warner Walk, and staff members, Steve Picazio, Michelle Singer, and Rachel Seneschal. I wanna give them a big round of applause 
uh, there's, uh, this, is, this is the sort of event that it's kind of like a duck. It may look smooth, but there's lots of the feet are paddling underneath. So I thank them so much for their thought and attention uh, on this event. Um, I wanna just take a special minute to uh, acknowledge um, our friend, Rachel Sinishal, who after I think 14 years at this library is retiring at the end of the month. We are so grateful for all of your contributions to this place and we uh, wish you a very happy retirement. Um, and uh, a final toast for the evening. May you raise your glass. May you all be safe and healthy this season and may we all take care of each other. Thank you. Good night. Thank you.